Good evening, viewers, and very warm welcome to the 13th episode of the Meet the, Meet the Media Veteran series. Today, in the episode, we have a very important filmmaker from Los Angeles, USA. She is someone who is an inspiration to the future generation filmmakers. Her cinema is deeply rooted on female issues and widely appreciated all across the globe. So, before presenting her detailed in intro, may I request Ms. Leila Jansi to this show. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Leila, for joining us today. And you are going to deliver, you know. Thank you so much for having me. Absolute honor having you on the show today. Leila Jansi is a BAFTA LA award winning writer, director, and producer. She began her filmmaking career in Ghana at the age of 19 with Ghana Film Company. Working her way to the United States on an artist on a scholarship to study film at Savannah College of Art and Design, her 2009 directorial debut, I Sing of a Bell, netted an unprecedented 11 nominations at the African Academy Awards, winning the Special Jury Award for Overall Best Film. She followed up with the Black Wheel Award nominated Ties That Bind, starring Kimberly Allies of Confirmation and John Q. Fain. The film was an official selection to AFI New African Film Festival in 2012. Her film like Cotton Twins that explores issues of the modern day slavery won Best Narrative Feature Film at the 2016 Savannah Film Festival, winning the same category at the Riverbed Film Festival in 2017. Her other credits include where children play with Grammy winner Mac, Mackie Gray and the Unifam advocacy film Sinking Sands and LA Film Festival Best Episodic Television Show 40 and Single for AMC's Urban Movie Channel. Lela has been recognized by various international organizations for continuously using her art to bring light of women issues and she has consistently made movies for women and about the women while employing diversity behind and in front of the camera. Her work had notable mentions at CNN and in the Hollywood. She is named amongst the 100 outstanding female entrepreneurs in Ghana. May I now request Lala to kindly deliver her talk on journey of telling female stories then and now. Thank you so much, Lala, for joining us today. Thank you for that humbling introduction. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Thank you so much. Uh, so today, we're here to talk about the journey well, my journey of telling um, female films. Um, I started in Ghana, uh, which is an African country. And I'm sure when I said African country, everybody understands immediately the connotation, which says there is so, there are some restrictions on feminism, on being a woman on being a tribal minority and it's not relegated to ghana it's something that permeates the whole world but since we're telling my story and since we're starting from ghana we're going to focus for now on how it was like telling female stories over there now what is very interesting which is almost a an interesting dichotomy between telling film stories there and telling film stories in other parts of the world is when, whilst I was there, when I started at 19, all the scripts that I wrote were about women. What was interesting was because women are sexualized, female films on the continent of Africa or in Ghana are preferred where the woman can wear skimpy clothes show her boobs show her big butt you know um and fall in love and be loved they were they were the preferred styles of storytelling till today they are the preferred styles because men need to you know stare at the women men need to um satisfy their own sexuality so the stories that are told are not necessarily about the agency that women require to, to sustain themselves in society. It's all about sexualizing 
themselves. And so when I became an independent filmmaker, by then I had moved to America, gotten back. Uh, and then when I knew I wanted to start directing, telling my own stories, I felt it was important for me to start telling the stories from my origins. And so I went back to Ghana to start telling stories from there. Growing up, I was never sexualized. There was really nothing to sexualize. <laughs> People who follow me know I am always teasing myself about my small body. So for me, there was really nothing to sexualize. So I did not have that experience of having my body stared at or, you know, ogled at. I do not have that experience. So, and my mother gave us a voice at a very young age growing up. So I never had that experience of seeing women on this pedestal of sex symbols. So when I started telling stories, that was not my journey. They, that was not the story. They were not the stories I was bound to tell because it was not my experience. So that brings me to the point that filmmakers, writers write about things that are dark and deep within themselves. We write about our own experiences. We write about things that are core to us. And so my stories that I told were based on relevant experiences that I had as a child growing up in a home where my parents were philanthropists and brought in disadvantaged youth, brought in disadvantaged relations, brought in disadvantaged women. And so my inspiration was all about telling women's stories that advance the course of women. Sink and Sand, which was about spousal abuse. This woman, Pabby, she's a teacher, uh, was gearing towards becoming a school principal. And here she finds herself in an abusive marriage and she is torn between keeping her marriage and being called wife and pleasing society, of course, that is for us women, it's the most paramount pleasing society. And she has to make that decision. Am I going to please society or am I going to fulfill my dreams? And we give her that leverage to be torn and spend that time so she doesn't come back to deal with an issue of had I noticed right? And so she stays in the marriage, perseveres, tries to keep her marriage, but then because she has a foundation of having agency, she is able to get out when she knows it is pointless to stay. And then we continue where we made Ties That Bind, which was again about three women. And by Ties That Bind, we began to bridge the gap between telling just um, about African characters as opposed to or, or, or Western characters. We began to blend them where we told the story of three women from diverse backgrounds an African, a Ghanaian woman who's educated, she's a doctor, she drives a car, she she's whole. And then you have a village woman who is rural minded, who is uh, a product of patriarchy. And then you have an American woman, an American black woman who is also educated, comes from a darker background of sexual abuse, drug abuse, due to systemic racism that goes on in America, which we're seeing live today, this moment. And we bring these three women together bound by one thing, which is childbearing, which most people think is the essence of the woman to have a child. And so we bring them together under this umbrella and get to tell their stories. Now, the interesting thing that happened with Ties That Bind when it comes to the business of filmmaking is that we took that film to Cannes with Sink and Tans. They were both going on sale at the same time. 
and we were told, oh, films about black women do not sell. This was in 2011, just a couple of days ago, 2011. But we'll, we'll come back to the business of film in a moment. So we went from Ties That Bind and we jumped. I think I got to that point in my career where I wouldn't say that I felt I told all the stories I had to tell about African women, but the society began to feel a little oppressive of the kind of stories we were telling, of the voice of a woman who was not considered sexual enough. So I got to that point where I felt I needed to stay home, America at home more. And so we came back to America and we started telling more African-American, more urban stories, which were, um, and then there was you, which was a more fun, romantic um, novel style film. And then we went on to uh, tell the story of Where Children Play, which is again, another powerful in installation of women's stories which had to do with generational sexual abuse that women had to deal with. But again, the women stay because they do not have agency. And we tell that story in an American context because really, what is the percentage of black American women with agency? Two, three jobs, you need to have a husband, you or your, your children are not going to have that your children are not going to get out of the systems that are being put in place to keep to keep them suppressed and the basis of that is abuse which they cannot seem to get out of and then we followed um that with like cotton twines we took us back to the continent to again talk about religious mm -hmm objectification of women using them for sexual toys for using them for atonement but actually what they're using them for is sexualizing them right and we followed that with a tv show 40 and single again the i the 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 foundation of that was the sexuality of a woman how free is a woman to practice her version of sexuality. Does she want to be bisexual? Does she want to be straight? Does she want to be lesbian? What freedom does she have? We And the show, even though it's about a lead character who is exploring her sexuality, it is also about the levels of marriage or the steps or the, the idea around a woman being in a marriage. So we have a character who is who is biracial, by the way, again, combining uh, Western values and African values in a, bi in, in, a, in a biracial character to bring to the fore the, the topics of, what do I really, I, okay, so I, I look like this, this is my color. In Africa, my color is superior because of issues of colorism. But then I am not insulated from societal norms and values and requirements that are imposed on me because I am a woman. And we surround her with other female characters who are also dealing with accepting what society, the burden that society has placed on us as women to be married, to be homemakers, to be child bearers, to be heavers of food and fetchers of water and cleaners. That is all we are. So we told all the stories over the course of my career and how have those stories, how have those films been accepted financially? And what numbers did we generate with eyeballs, people who followed the films, right? So that brings us now to the business of telling female stories. 
when we started in 2011, the only films that Hollywood was interested in about Africa were films that depicted, that, that depicted the continent as poor, as deprived, war-torn, HIV, little kids with flies buzzing around their slimy noses. That was the extent of the African narrative. So it was very hard to permeate the industry with this material. When we sold Sink and Sands, we were not even paid a dime because the distributors, well, I'm not sure how much I am going to make because it's too safe. I mean, I, heard, I, I totally heard a range of excuses make is trying to sell Sink and Sands. It's not funny. It's too dark. Um, what? It was, it was just a range. It was just a whole bunch of reasons why they could not or would not buy the film. Same thing happened with Ties That Bind, which we took to the market at Cannes. And the excuse there was films about Black women do not sell. We managed to sell Ties That Bind for a little bit, which helped to finance, and then there was you. But by a, it wasn't enough. It, it was not, it wasn't encouraging to even continue telling stories about Black women. Again, I feel it's one of those systemic things or, or, or systemic mechanisms put in place to keep women down, keep African, keep Africa in a certain idea, in a, in a certain, in a dystopia almost, where Africa cannot be anything more than the West wants it to be, the West wanted it to be, which is why they invaded and then were not successful, so they had to get out. So the anger of, I guess, the anger of having been pushed out, causing them to just relegate Africa to a background, to um, a place of poverty where they feel like nothing good can ever, 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 ever come out of Africa. And so that has been the challenge selling films from me, the selling films about Africa that are positive that show the African as educated. When, by the time we made Like Cotton Twines, the industry was different. Where there was, it was, on, uh, it was right on the cusp of a revolution for female storytellers and female stories. So the success we chopped with Like Cotton Twines was, phenomenal it was completely out of this world till today we get requests for uh, festival screenings we get requests for uh special screenings because there is now a hunger for female-led films it's still not easy you would probably still need a white body in there to be able to push your film but it's definitely like eons better than it was previously. And when we did 40 and single, by of course, now there is the LGBTQ rights. So that also helped that film where we were not even um, run out of Ghana or, you know, beaten because we were making this film that someone would probably say glorifies LGBTQ culture. But luckily, because again, people fought, there was a revolution to end the discrimination. We were able to find success with that material as well. It's definitely not been an easy journey. It is much easier right now. The key thing is positioning. Being able to position yourself, being able to position your material in a way that would 
um, give you a leg up. So before you go into telling a female story, you need to understand your audience. You need to understand, you, you need to have a strategy for sale. How am I going to get my film out there? What kind of story am I going to tell that is not going to be offensive to the sensibilities of a Western buyer who has a preconceived notion of what Africa should be, of what India should be, because remember, India was also colonized, or the preconceived notion of what a woman's place is. Luckily, we have, we now we have movies like Wonder Woman. We have movies like uh, Avengers Endgame and Black Widow playing a significant character. We have filmmakers like Greta Gerwig who are bringing out significant stories about women. We have filmmakers like Ava DuVernay who have been, you know, who has a show, uh, Queen Sugar, we, who has uh, told the story, who's really leading a revolution with what she's doing and hiring more women. So it's almost been normalized now to have um, female-led films and female helmers. But you still have to break in with a story that is acceptable. That is still, because you, I mean, I know a lot of female stories that have been told that have not got anywhere. So you still have, unfortunately, we're still in a box where you have to tell a female story that has um, buzzwords, LGBT, um, a power woman, you know, maybe um, a woman wielding an ask, uh, an ax, I don't know, something like that. Um, it, it has to be, it, it cannot be anything that is safe. It has to be something that you are almost beating the audience or your buyers over the head with to be able to have your foot in the door. Above all, it has to be well done. You cannot make a film that looks like a student film and expect a buyer or a festival to accept it. You, you're telling a female story, all right, but it has to be professionally done. You need to surround yourself with the right team to be able to have a product that is marketable. It doesn't have to be commercial. It has to be marketable, though. It has to be something that your buyers can brand and put out on the market. And even if it's a handful of people who are into artsy fair, that's fine. If it's a majority of people who are into commercial fair because you made a commercial film, that's even better. And so, in a nutshell, that is my pitch on my journey making female films and the, the status of making female films right now. Thank you so much, uh, Lela, for such a, you know, uh, enriching talk, uh, Nidhi Bey. You shared your journey from, you know, Africa to uh, USA. I think same story everywhere, every part of the world, same story regarding the females. Uh, it can be con contextualized in, for, for any society, actually. Uh, but your your films have been, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, tales of uh, the, the stories which you have picked from, you know, uh, from your land, which are so original. And I have seen, you know, your film like Cotton Twines, at Goa Film Festival, which was very well received there. And that was a very, very powerful film. And, and this film has, you know, gone to several film festivals. Uh, so this was really a wonderful talk uh, uh, to the audience today. Uh, we have, you know, a couple of questions to you. Uh, my first question to you, you know, you know, you are basically a sort of role model for the, you know, female filmmakers from all across the globe, actually. The kind of cinema you have picked up and the kind of cinema you are propagating at your end, that's, that's like, you know, eye opener for all of us. So, you know, uh, what, what was the trigger point for you uh, that you started picking up, you know, female stories, especially from Ghana and, and now, now to the US also. So what 
actually did, did it what was a trigger point for you when you started you know uh, making your journey you know i am going to pick up you know female centric films only i think it's simple because i'm a woman <laughs> okay, okay. and that is why there is the cry for there to be more opportunities for female filmmakers female storytellers because i uh, in december i did some work for uh what an amazing company called cherry picks i'm still doing some work for them where i had to audit their films for the beckdale test and the beckdale test is a scorecard for films that give opportunities to women to talk on screen and you would be surprised to see how many films in which women do not talk to each other and even if they were to speak to each other they're talking about a man i was shocked i did not know there was anything so pervasive right mm -hmm. i i it blew my mind it completely blew my mind that in 2019 in 2020 i guess those films were made a lot of many years ago but there were some films that were as early as 2018 that were made and women did not talk to each other women did there were female characters that did not have a name but in the films that were made by women the films had women talking to each other mm -hmm. i'm not expecting a man to tell a story about women having their period. You don't know what you're talking about, right? I don't expect a man to tell a story about women and their experiences with childbirth. You don't know what you're talking about. That is a woman's story to tell, not yours, because we better understand what it means to wake up in the morning and have your bed blood stained. We have those images. My friend Dory Barton, she made a very beautiful movie called Girl Flu about that. Now, a guy wouldn't have been able to tell that story. It would have to be a woman. So for me, telling female stories, it's really because I am a woman and that is my experience. That is, that is my journey. That is the voice inside me. Those are the stories that come to me naturally stories about women and I, that is why i tell female stories and that is why if we are going to see more female stories out there more women have to be storytellers more women have to be let into the through the door into the room to sit at the table don't just let them in and have them stand there and be assistants or ad's or or script supervisors you need to put them at the table where they can make decisions and impact the storytelling process. True that. I think very well said, Lala. Those sensibilities are totally different. The way female filmmakers sort of look at a particular narrative and particular story. So those sensibilities are really totally different. I can understand that, that point of view. And during your talk, you know, uh, the way you sort of, you know, uh, elaborated on the, you know, the way female characters have been sort of, you know, maintain a sort of cliche, you know, all across of the world, you know. They have been, show they have been showcased in, in a particular uh, frame and in a, in a, from a particular point of view. So I remember a very famous article by 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 when I was doing my film studies course uh, by Laura Mulvey, the visual pleasure and narrative cinema. You know, he she she very clearly wrote in there. You know how the female objective objective the female have been sort of you know made the objective for object for the pleasure actually in mm -hmm. in the cinema. And mm -hmm. and this all started maybe from the advertisement also, and then finally you know percolated to the cinema as well. I, I have, you know, another question to you, you know, uh, there are a whole generation of, you know, female filmmakers all across the world. I will especially take two names, Jane Campaign from uh, USA and, and, and Mira Nair from, um, uh, again, from USA. You know, what is your take on, on the work of these, these two great filmmakers? You know, how do you look at their work? You, know, you, have, you are also dealing with the uh, uh, female oriented cinema and they have also made, you know, cinema related to the females. Though they have explored other genres also, but I, I just want to have your take on the, you know their cinema, which is basically female centric. Marinere is one of the reasons I'm a filmmaker today, and I I completely love her. Last week I was watching her masterclass on filmmaking. What I admire about Mira is 
her style of storytelling. It's very unique. It's very advanced. It's very relatable. Now, I feel like I've watched, uh, I've watched Salam Bombay. I've watched um, Monsoon Wedding. I've watched Mississippi Masala. I've watched um, um, The Namesake. I've watched um, Escaping My Mind. But I've watched a good, I've watched a lot of her films. Yeah. And again, I think she is also telling the female perspective from her point of view. Because if you look at uh, the namesake, the woman was just a wife. The man had agency. The son took agency from the father and became the leader of the home at, at, upon the father's demise. And what really broke me in the namesake was a 45-year-old woman. She is in her prime having to leave America and go back to India and really start her life from scratch. Because she wanted to be a singer before she was married off. And then now that she's had her kids, her kids are all married and her husband is dead at 45. Young girl, because 45, you're young. <laughs> now she's gone back to start her life from scratch. And then you have one soon wedding where this girl is in love with someone else. And she has to marry someone else. And a generation of abuse that is meted out on women. And I feel like Mira and I, we tell the same kind of stories where we're not preaching at you that this is what should happen but we're just expo we're just shining a light you you she, she mira puts the camera on the situation and you think about it and it hits you in the gut you're like wow how did we get here how did we find ourselves here so both women that's really the core of what they do where they're not preaching at you but they are exposing things that they expect and we all expect people to watch the film and say wow this shouldn't be like that they're not telling you it should not be like that they're just gonna put the image out there you make that decision for yourself and that is more of what we need where we can resurrect the conscience of the patriarchy if they have one <laughs> true that, true that, true that. I think very well answered. Now we have questions from you know audience. So I take first question of Mr. Umar Azmi. He has a very interesting question, a very long one. So um, <laughs> uh, this is on your screen now, very long one. So you cannot see. Uh, you can see question now. Uh, yes. He, you know, Margaret Atwood published The Handmaid's Tale in 1985, a story about women in a dystopian setting. Although many adaptations happened earlier on in theater and cinema, it took more than 30 years to make a commercial recognize and appreciate show uh, what Hulu made one in 2017. Do you hold the society on the whole accountable for not accepting a disturbing but as real as it can get the feminist narrative like that? Or is it the producers for not willing to produce and sell the content like that? That is a perfect and beautiful question because I'm dealing with such a situation currently on a script that we're working on. We're thinking about whether to scrap it completely because it just shows women in a victim state, in a dystopian state. So I feel to answer that question, I think it's a little bit of both. Where previously, object, a, a story that is all female-led like that would probably not have been commercially viable to some studio executive. And then also, maybe I think maybe society was not ready to be guilt tripped. But with Trump winning, suddenly everything began to, everything that we thought, oh, as Americans, we are over this. We're over racism. We're over the objectification of women. 
things that Americans thought, oh, we're bigger than. During the Hillary Clinton campaign, you could just see that it was just swept under the carpet. It just needed mm -hmm. the right conditions to be brought. It just needed, it's just, that, that fabric just needed to be dropped into the right chemical solution. And then you could see the core of the society that nothing's changed at all. If anything, it's probably getting worse. So it is a little bit of both where producers were not ready to take that risk and society was not ready to see because they thought these things are ancient, they are archaic, we're not there anymore. But suddenly this image is on screen and you're like, oh my God, this is happening right now when you have a political party that can put a group of men in a room and expect them to make decisions on the, on the reproductive rights of women. How dare you? Now people are, are confronted with the true core of America. To that. I think, Umar, your question is very well answered. Uh, so we have one comment from, uh, you know, Reo Mercy from Ghana. He said, uh, hello, listening from Ghana. Yes, I agree. A real mo role model Lala is. So he has a sort of word of appreciation for you. And then we have another. Yeah, you can see him on screen now. Uh, so Reo Mercy is making, oh, yes, I agree. Real role model Lala is. So we have another word of appreciation from uh, Paratajit Barua. He says, yeah, it is really a very productive conversation. So he is watching and enjoying the conversation at the moment. Uh, then we, we yeah. have, yeah. Thank you, Mercy. And then we have another question from Ashwini Gambhir. He belongs to a very reputed film student of India, Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute, basically. Uh, so here's a very interesting question, you know. How you see the women representation in contemporary Indian cinema? What's your view on real women character is right representation of the real life character in, in world cinema? So he's sort of, you know, want your answer in this context, real, real world and the real, real world. I think it depends on who's telling the story. You have a little bit of both. You do have um, some... I think commercial films do not necessarily represent real world women, but the more uh, artsy films do represent real world women. So with cinema, we take a lot of creative license to tell a story that is commercial because it's really all about the green. How much money can the film make? So if putting Kim Kardashian in a film, who I do not necessarily consider to be a real world woman who is dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges of a regular woman, my neighbor next door. If putting some, if if if, if creating a character that embodies her brings you money, that is what most people are going to do. And that, that has actually been my challenge as a filmmaker because I have always tried to put, and someone like Mira Nair, we have always tried to put pulsating women, women that you, you open your door and you, because when I wrote Where Children Play and all the actors received their scripts, I had a meeting with one actress and she held my hand tight and said, you told my story. That's why I'm doing this film. And this is a name, big name actor. She was really shaking and she started telling me the story of her, how her grandmother was raped, her mother was raped, and she was raped. I was flabbergasted. And that was not the only experience. When we were location scouting, we knocked on the door of a house we wanted. A woman opened the door and said, Oh, really? You're making a movie. What's, what's your story about? And we told her and she said, oh, my God. My father, my, my grandfather raped my my grandmother. That's how I was. That's how my mother was born. And I am also a product of rape. And so you're confronted by you. You have this script you that you've not even shot yet. And you're confronted by multiple scenarios of real life women who are are who are like real life and are 
merge into one. So there is a little bit of both, but for films that are more commercial, they might adulterate a little bit. I'm sure Ashwini, you got your answer. Uh, Ashwini has, you know, one more question. He says, how relevant is the film school education to filmmaking and industry? Also would like to know what are those things that which film school never teaches, but we learn in the practical world. I think very interesting since you have a, a film school background also. I think you should go to film school for a couple of reasons. The first reason is networking. Most of my crew till today are people I went to school with. The best editor I've ever worked with, Asha Bingham, we went to school together. One of the best DPs I've worked with, Aaron Wong, we went to school together. So film school is an avenue to meet your future crew, right? Um, second reason, it helps you to become a more, um, comprehensive filmmaker you know how to you know about your dollies you know about i remember i just shot a film in january and we were talking about what dolly to get and i said i know for sure i want the peewee dolly and all the crew looked at me like i don't even think you know what that does and i'm like really now why because i'm a woman or to have an accent why would you think i don't know but because i went to film school i could confidently challenge him about the creep and crawl aspects of a peewee dolly and he's like wow okay so she knows right so film school gives you that opportunity film school allowed me to edit on avid all three avids from a uh, um, media composer to nitrous so i can use all of those I can use Premiere Pro, I can mount, I can rig a camera and unrig a camera, I can shoot on film. And so if I have a gaffer who doesn't know what light temperature I want, I can tell him. But that is what film school did for me. And um, what film school, and then in film school also, this is the secret that I found out late, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? In film school, you can actually sh graduate and have a feature under your belt. Your crew is gonna be free. Your equipment is gonna be free. Your script notes are gonna be free. So you <laughs> go to film school, use that opportunity, maybe in your final year or in, in, in your junior year and write a script and every weekend you shoot a scene. Every weekend you shoot a scene. Every weekend you shoot a scene. By the time you graduate, you have a feature that you can use to put yourself ahead. Now, uh, what was the second question? That was the uh, second this, question. So he says, you know, also would like to know what, what are those things what which you could so never teach us, but you learn practically. Okay. How hard it is to sell a film, how hard it is to get your foot through the door. They don't teach you all that. They don't, because when you're in film school and you're working with a student crew, nobody's complaining about breakfast. But in real life, you're going to have a mutiny on set on food or it's, it's just, they don't teach you that it can be hard working with human beings. That is something you're going to learn on set. That's something you're going to learn the hard way. Film school glamorizes everything you think. I mean, I went to film school with, you know, kids who come to the classroom and they cross their legs. They have like a bandana on their arm and like future director, but right now they're not directing so yeah film school gives you illusions of grandeur um you think you're gonna come out and take over the world but it's not like that but it could be like that if you're if you take this advice that i just gave where by the time you graduate you have a feature from all the uh, equipment in the school to that it gives you a you know, lot of scope to, to ground yourself for the future world actually yeah, I, I'm sure Ashwini, you got your answer. Now we have very interesting question from Saurabh Goyal. He says, after Black Panther, there seems to be a positive narrative built up around black themes. But with a filmmaker like Jordan Pell suggesting how he may not be casting a white actor as a lead in his movies, do you think there finally is a change in how Hollywood sees Africa? 
No, I don't think there's a change because Black Panther was not set in Africa. It was about a utopian Africa, but it was not set in Africa. It was set in Wakanda. Where is Wakanda? I don't know Wakanda. I never been there. I don't see it on my map. And that was one problem that I had when Black Panther, Black Panther came out. And it hurt me as an African that Mandela didn't do anything for Africa, for African cinema of all the films we've seen about Mandela. Uh, we've seen gorgeous films from um, Charles Burnett about Africa. It didn't do anything. We've seen gorgeous films from Ama Asante of, about the strength of the African. It didn't do anything. I mean, look, Idi Amin was a horrible guy. But Last Kid of Scotland, it showed the power of an African man, that an African man actually could, you know, handle his own affairs a bit in a cruel way. But it still showed the guy that the guy knew what he was doing. And even the white people could not exert any authority over him. Right. But it didn't do anything for Africa. This was significant, powerful African men on, on big screen. But it, it didn't do anything. So uh, uh, it's it's uh, Black Panther is really a uh, what aboutism, what ifism, all these isms. What if there had been no slave trade? There was a slave trade. What if there was? What are you gonna? Do? It's it's it. There was. So going to make a movie about what could have been. I don't, you, again, it's the idea of what could have been, not what is. That's how they're looking at it. And that's why and, and Black Panther, again, was a comic book made beautifully, wonderfully, intelligently by Ryan Coogler. But it was still what could have been, not what is. And that's how they're going to look at it. It's not going to change anything. I don't think it's going to change. If 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 it would have changed anything, it would have changed everything. Immediately, Black Panther came out. But how many movies have been licensed from Africa since Black, Black Panther? True None. True Not one movie has been licensed, which True. is a big scope African film. No. And don't say Netflix opened up in Africa. Netflix wants money. They want audience. And if... If South Africa and Nigeria, who have more, uh, 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 population running into uh, 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 what six figures, is giving them the money, of course they're going to open up there. That doesn't mean anything to African cinema. Doesn't mean anything because what are the films that Netflix is licensing from there? Let's look at the films. Are they films that a studio executive is going to be like, ooh, let me green light a project from this filmmaker? No. True that, true that. I'm sure Saurabh, your question is well answered. Now, uh, we have another question from Omar Azmi. In fact, he is saying that thank you for your views on my previous question. Also, Hannah gets by a comedian wrote that and performed Nanette in 2018, where she admitted the fact that she had been talking about the same child trauma of physical abuse over the years. But in the end, of, in the end she spun it off with a joke. For Nanette, she didn't. And it left a gaping hole. I think she he's sort of complimenting what you talked about uh, during your talk. So we'll move to the you know next question. You, you you want to say something on this, Lala? Again, it goes back to saying that writers write something that is deep within them that they themselves need to confront. And I think the reason she's successful is because she's writing her truth. She's telling her truth. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're a male or female filmmaker, the key thing to making successful movies or telling stories that are relevant are telling stories that are relatable. People need to be able to see themselves on screen. And that is why we're all talking about representation and inclusion, telling the story of the world as you see it. True that, true that. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Ajay Shetty. He says, is there a dividing commercial and art cinema in Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If there is an art 
cinema in Ghana. There is no art cinema in Ghana. It's when I've never met him, but um, Kwao Ansa, who is, oh, I've met Kwao Ansa. I wasn't going to say his name first, but Kwao Ansa is one of the relevant uh, pioneer filmmakers in Ghana. He made art um, many years ago. He, he started again, I think in the mid 2000s, I'm not sure what happened. It fizzled out. And then uh, Keen Ampau, Keen Ampau. I doff my hat to this guy. He also made one of my favorite Ghanaian films called The, uh, the Long Road to Kukuran to Me. Mm -hmm. Significant, beautiful film that had, is ageless. He made art, but that these people were making films when Germany was supporting the art industry in Ghana. So they were German, these films were all German financed. And that is, and I, I don't think they even had any commercial value in Ghana because they were screened abroad, right? Right now in Ghana, it's all about what kind of goofy thing can we put on screen to make a lot of money in the theaters? That is the thing right now where it's all commercial fair. And there is, there. I mean, um, I don't necessarily consider him a Ghanaian filmmaker. His crossover, um, Blitz. He made a film called The Burial of Kojo, which is on Netflix right now that everybody can watch. Now that's art. That's mm -hmm. art. But it's I don't think he necessarily made it for a Ghanaian audience. I don't think it was made for it's it's an African story told for an audience with that palette. It's it's not something it wasn't made for a Ghanaian audience. I don't think it was. So just an additional question on that, uh, uh, Lala, do you remember any, any, you know, any Ghanaian film uh, to the famous film festivals like, you know, Khan Berlin, Toronto uh, in the recent past? That have done what? So, you know, uh, normally, you know, the, the film industry or film industry is normally judged by the, you know, participation, you know, in this yes. prestigious yes. festival. So do you remember any, you know, Ghanaian uh, film uh, participating in Khan Berlin, Venice, Toronto? In this film festival? No, no. Okay. And you know the thing with festivals is that a lot of people do not realize you don't necessarily get in on merit. You don't get into a film festival because your film is good. Let's True clear that. that right now. True you that. get into a film festival because you know a programmer. So a lot of True. films go into festivals and you're like, really? How did I could make a better film with fifty dollars? But somebody knows a programmer. That's that. really probably 90% of films get in because they either went through the, the film festival's program, you know, like Cannes has a program, Toronto has a program, Sundance has a program, you know, you either have a, pub, a good publicist, a good producer who's connected, or you've been through the festival's program. But for your film to just get into those six major festivals on merit, that's that's near impossible True. so and and ghana does not have an industry to be able to have relationships with these festivals for their films to go in there so is a state is sponsoring the cinema in ghana uh, or is just the private industry there it's a private industry it's a private industry right now uh, last i heard the government, uh, uh, they instituted a film commission. I don't have all the details, but I do understand that, in, that there is a film commission. What the commission intends to do, I have no idea. Okay. And how equipped they're gonna be, I that's left to be seen. Okay, okay. So we have you know another question from Kafoy Price. He says, uh, what if you cannot afford a film school? Uh, what's the alternative? What is the future of Ghanaian film industry? So he, she has two questions, basically. Okay. What if you cannot afford film school? There right. is a wonderful, beautiful thing that has come now called YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, self-help videos on YouTube. 
That's one. Two, try and get on a film set and learn from filmmakers. I've reached, a lot of people have reached out to me in the past to shadow. And going forward, what I would like to do is to bring two female filmmakers from Ghana. Anytime I'm filming, I would select two female aspiring filmmakers to, shot, to come on the set, not necessarily to shadow me, but to just shadow the set, just get to see how things are done. So that's um, one way to, um, do, to, to learn filmmaking. YouTube, get on a film set, read, read, read. There are so many websites that will teach you so many things, read, and also practice. The iPhone right now, it's got so many features on that you can practice yourself, practice, make mistakes, and get better. And right. what is the future of the Ghanaian film industry? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I know, though, that the future of anything is unity, having a unified voice. So mm -hmm. if, the, if the industry, the filmmakers, if the players get to that point where they can stop bickering and backbiting and trying to be, I'm the first person to do this. I'm the first person to do that. Or I'm the best person. The problem with Africa, with, with Africans is the colonial mentality where we, we, we feel like we always have to get a further, right? Instead of getting to being together because oh if i'm alone i can run faster if i'm alone i can run faster but i think if you're together you actually get much much you, you cover a greater distance even though you're together meaning someone is looking behind you hey someone is coming from behind let's hide someone is looking to the left hey let's hide you have a lot of eyes watching the watching the journey and protecting each other so yeah, if, if, if the industry gets to that point where you don't chase people out for having a voice, where you don't bury people for um, being good at what they do, then of course there will be a future. But until then, it is what it is. True that. So Lala, I just saw your mobile phone actually. So <laughs> any, any plan uh, making a film through mobile phone? Yet. Not, Not yet. yet. I no, not yet. Not yet. It's, okay. it's not not yet. Maybe a documentary, but Maybe a documentary. yeah, so not you, get a feature. So would you like to give some insights to the audience? You know, if you sort of plan a film on iPhone, so your crew will remain same or uh, would it sort of you know become it would, be, it would have to be completely reduced. Okay. It would have to be completely, completely reduced. It, you don't need that many people on an iPhone. So if you have a crew of 100, you're probably looking at 20. Because why, has, why I asked this question, uh, this is going to be a very fascinating space, you know, for uh, shooting your film through iPhone. Uh, I remember Steven Soddenberg, he shot his film on iPhone and it was released in Berlin, uh, very well received there, in fact. So this is going to be sort of, you know, future of cinema as well. You know, people will come yes. very soon to the iPhone. Yes. Yes. Making Absolutely. It is going to be, and it, it's going to also be a marketing tool to True say that. this whole film was shot on an iPhone. Yeah, it will. I do. I, I am working on a documentary, which actually might, it will probably be better to shoot because if you want to be able to um, blend in, and cover people and get them in their raw where they're not looking at the camera and feigning a performance for you and you want to get the 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 real deal of people's emotions you can better do it on an iphone strapped to your body and you're meandering through people so it you're absolutely right it is going to be the at least of documentary filmmaking it yeah. will yeah yeah it will be the future and it's going to be a very personal experience actually shooting through the iPhone actually. You, yes. you can really go to the object and subject. Yes. Exactly. Exactly.
so we have you know another word of appreciation from uh, adnan jamil he says i learn many things today thank you lela and also rizwan sir so he has included me also and <laughs> great so umar azmi is sort of you know he is writing so many questions to do he has another comment and question as well uh, he says thank you for your views on my previous question also hena gets by a comedian wrote that performed the nanny in 2018 where she admitted the fact that she uh, had been talking about the same child trauma of the physical abuse over the years but the end she is pinned off uh, with a joke for nanny she didn't and it left a uh, gaping hole in my life because i realized that it was too so strong about so many things in my life how do you empower your fellow writers and directors to make content like that or to Okay, I don't think that question is complete. Okay. I think sometimes when we leave a story open ended it is to allow you to fill the hole yourself. It it is to allow Again, I'm working on a film right now where the ending is very open ended we and we planned it like that to leave it up to debate sure. to ask to where where should you go from here what sure. should you consider what do you think happened and that also helps you to be able to connect to the film on another level where um we don't tie it all up with a bow and send you off with a shoot right you you have to um again that's the that's that's the job of a good writer or a good uh, uh, or a good storyteller when they can leave you with a lingering feeling so i i i apologize on her behalf for the gaping hole but hopefully you've thought through you thought through the work of art and you used that as a as a stepping stone to your process of healing but if you just leave the hole there and you don't think through it and consider the characters then i don't know you're ble you're bleeding right now right <laughs> but you should consider you know finding strength from the characters sure. or maybe she might come back with a sequel you know we don't know or somebody sure. might might come and um finish it so before i take next question lala since it's early morning in usa i'll request you to continue with your tea and we <laughs> will do the answer session I'm also i'm sorry i've not i've not had my 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 cup yeah your, it looks like you know it's going to be a long session because a lot of questions are coming up oh my uh, god so <laughs> ashwini yeah. gambhir uh, he thank you she he says gratitude to miss lala for insightful answer Uh, so he got his answer well uh, now we have another question from saurabh goyal he says with filmmakers such as avadyu uh, varne and uh, diri now helming big budget hollywood films and films such as the selma uh, in mudbound do you see a new crop of black women filmmakers coming up or have a level playing field in near future yes yes that is that is definitely happening i can see that in my own life where opportunities are coming i mean you're getting you're getting big scripts that are not $500,000 or a million dollars now you're getting scripts that are like 5 million and above so yes yes there is going to become and as these filmmakers continue to have successful films commercially successful films like near the coster is coming out with a uh, candy man which is going to be very successful uh, you have stella meggy who has had her own share of successful films as those filmmakers continue to make commercially relevant films there would be more opportunities so i am so grateful for these women for paving the way for all of us okay thank you uh, sheikh rahimuddin he says this session is very informative and uh, then uh, naj ubar uh, he says something kukuran to me wrote to akra so i don't know maybe from yes, hana <laughs> the name of the movie from the uh um kin ampao is kukuran to me the road to akra yes yes okay great <laughs> so 
we have another question from saurabh goel he says one of the most famous hollywood classics gone with the wind does essentially embolden the dangerous uh, uh, myth by showing black americans as happy and obedient slaves do you have any observation or opinion to make on such problematic legacy yes unfortunately you do see specks of it still in some films but thank god for black twitter if you do that right now your film will be dead and buried so mm -hmm. with social media has come an advent of very loud voices a cacophony of voices who are not going to sit back and allow that to happen anymore none of us are going to allow that to happen anymore where the black woman is it's it's a slave when i going to see that anymore yes it might for example if i were to tell a story in ghana about a rich family a rich white family it's What time is it in Ghana? Well, it's 8:30 a.m. in LA, so it's about 8:00, 9:00, 10:00, 11:00, 12:00, 1, 2. It's what 2:30, 3:30 p.m. in Ghana. This very moment, the slave in their home is black. Yes. But how do you tell that story? It's what's going to make the difference. You can tell that story all right. but who are you giving agency to who are you telling whose point of view are you telling the story from are you telling the story from the point of view of this white family with the little african woman slave and she's bringing tea and the kids are playing and she has to go change their diaper and come back and she has like 10 lines in the film or <laughs> are you telling the story from the point of view of this woman who is a servant to this white family in Africa and how she is handling her own home like uh, the Netflix film uh, Roma how is she handling her home and in 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 and juxtapose that with how she's handling the kids of this white family if you're going to make a racial disparity film to to be for your film to be a voyeur definitely we're all going to be behind you those are the kind of stories we want to tell because a film is a catalyst for change you're shining the light on this disparity you're shining the light on this wrongdoing if you're coming to africa to be uh, to work in an oil company please come with your steward from britain come with your steward from America don't come and hire my mother someone who could be my mom to be your servant in your home you should not do that even if you do you got to treat them like a worker not a servant it's not their job to uh, uh clean your house and change the nappies of your kids if you wanted someone to change the nappy of your kid please What is your wife doing at home? Possibly nothing, doing parties. That's what they really do. They just go to parties and go to parties and go to parties. Why is she changing the diaper herself? Please come with a nanny from an, from your country to change the diaper of your kids. Do not relegate the black woman to servanthood. Don't make those kind of films. Even if that is what's happening right now, if you're going to make those films, tell the story in a way that the people will be ashamed of what they are doing you got to be a voice for change that's what film is about to that i'm sure sir of your question is well answered uh, we have i think probably last question of the day uh, uh, first a comment uh, kafi praise says you know it's very informative thanks lela then we have last question from the naj ubar i think she's from ghana uh she says ghana has a private industry as you rightly put it uh what are your recommendations on ways ghana can break into commercial filmmaking i what are the ways ghana can break into commercial filmmaking well they are doing commercial well if unless she means commercial on a global scale because right now within the locality they are making commercial films 
but if it's to break into commercial films worldwide, then the scope of the film has to be commercial. Because you cannot make a small film and open it in theaters. It's not gonna be reasonable for anybody. So the scope of the film has to be bigger, which means the budgets have to be bigger. Big budget, big opening. Small budget, small screen, small opening, right? With the advent of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Original and Apple TV, things are gonna change where, and then especially with coronavirus, keeping everybody indoors, which is probably gonna span the rest of the year, small screen is going to take precedent so you're going to have only the tentpole movies going into the theaters you're going to have only the spider-man and the marvel stuff the dc comics they are going to be going into the the theaters more you're going to have smaller films go on netflix go on television releases like lifetime and hbo go on hbo max go on apple tv go on amazon go on hulu they're going to go in that direction if you want, if Ghana, if Ghana filmmakers want their films to get to these points, this is my advice. Get a publicist. Before you start working on your film, hire a publicist. Hire a publicist who's going to look at your film and realistically tell you whether you have elements in your film that are uh, buzzworthy. Okay. And if... Yes, the, this, these are topical subjects that are buzzworthy, that we can get in front of a variety, we can get in front of a reporter, we can get into festivals, we can get in front of a programmer. Then you are getting closer to making commercial fair. I think very important insights, Natch. I think your question is well answered. And uh, this was the last question from the audience side today. Now I have my last question from Lela to end this session. Uh, Lela, you have wonderfully explored this, you know, uh, your journey as a female filmmaker and your films have been very, very powerful, especially, you know, they are women-centric film. So when are you going to explore other genres also, you know, beside the uh, female-centric themes? <laughs> very, very. Actually, my new film, uh, Miss Havisham Effect, it, it, it breaks the norm a little bit. It is about a father who is uh, a crack addict. So I, I have broken the mold and um, I maybe, I guess, you know, I'm open to receiving scripts. I'm open to receiving scripts. So if someone sends me a script that is starring a man, of course, there's nothing wrong with making movies about men. I would love to tell <laughs> a story about men. Just as a writer, I'm, I'm not going to force a story to happen. The story has to come to me naturally. It has to warm my soul before I put a pen to paper. So when I get an opportunity or when, when that time comes, when I, I, I get that story about a man in India, in Hyderabad, then <laughs> I will come to India and make that film. So very soon, hopefully. I'm sure we are going to watch, you know, more films from your side. And it's been so wonderful talking to you uh, today, Lala. You uh, the kind of talk you have delivered today. Uh, this was very, very informative and you know, very enriching talk. Such a scintillating talk, you know, we will listen from you today. And I would like to inform my viewers, you know, we are going to have Lala for two more sessions. So we'll be declaring those dates very soon. Uh, uh, I should thank you, Lala. You know, you joined us, you know, very early morning in LA today. Uh, this really uh, is absolute privilege and honor for us. You know, you you sort of joined uh, uh, today for our audience uh, in this series. Thank you so much for having me. India is home, so anything at all for India, I will do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lila, for joining us today. And I hope you you learned something, and I've learned a lot too. I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you so much. So audience, uh, uh, that's it for the today and uh, you will be having another personality at 11.30 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we have a very eminent and very senior film journalist, film critic and cultural journalist Mr. Ajit Rai tomorrow. Uh, so uh, I'm sure this talk is also going to be very, very interesting. So I'll request all of you to uh, join us 11.30 a.m. tomorrow on our FB page. So till then, uh, uh, 
Goodbye. Good day to all of you. Uh, please keep watching our FB channel. Thank you so much for joining us today.